Hi everyone, Wonia Tiba with Buckskin Revolution here, and I am visiting the space that I used to live for a long time in an off-grid community in Oregon, and I am getting ready to teach hide tanning at a gathering next week, and so I was going through a bunch of my old hides, just kind of seeing the status of some of them, and found a bunch of furs that I've been neglecting for a while. So I wanted to talk a little bit about storing furs and hides and things to be aware of and what happens when things go wrong like happened with some of my furs. So if you're storing hides for making buckskin long term, salting hides, wet salting them so that you're, they're salted when they're fresh off of the animal or fresh after fleshing and processing so that they remain moist in storage is a wonderful way to go because that way the hide is going to be easier to scrape because the grain has never dried and kind of stuck tighter onto the skin. However, if you're trying to tan furs, then it's not the way to go because storing something wet long term tends, even with salt, to let it break down a little bit and then you're going to end up with that fur getting loose and slipping out when you go to tan it. So furs are better stored dried and I don't like storing things that I'm going to be doing dried with salt because they're kind of opposite techniques for me. Salt is for keeping things wet and no salt is for when you want something dry because salt is going to result in a hide that one either has to be rinsed for a long time which again more water on a hide with fur might cause it to break down and that fur to slip over time or two if you don't rinse the the salt out really thoroughly, you're going to end up with a hide that tends to be clammy because salt is always drawing moisture to it. So it's going to be drawing moisture out of the air to your skins and your furs and who wants to wear clammy, damp furs or skins? Not ideal. So if I can avoid salt, I like to avoid salt. Then the issue with keeping dried hides, I guess I should back up. If you have a freezer, that's an awesome means to go. But I was living here off grid long term, so no freezers or refrigerators. Likewise, often I, I don't have, even when I do live with electricity and a refrigerator, I often don't have space for all of the hides that come my way. So freezing is often not an option for me in my life. That said, there are some issues with storing dried hides long term, mainly things wanting to eat them. So dogs are always excited about dried hides. We train them to do that by giving them rawhide treats. So making sure that you store them away from dogs or other outdoor pests, um, you know, skunks, raccoons, coyotes, foxes, any animal that can eat hide. If you have it somewhere that it has access to it, it's going to try to eat your hides. So I'm usually trying to store my hides inside away from such critters. Also mice and squirrels will totally eat hides if they get a chance, um, especially anywhere the hide is folded. Mice love climbing inside a rolled up hide and chewing away on the edges that they can get to. It's like a lovely little mouse hidey hole with a banquet set for them all the time. So if sometimes stored rolls of hides and then think they're fine and then unroll them and there's actually been a mouse living in there chewing on my hides. So not storing them anywhere where mice or squirrels have access is also key. Given those things, the next critters you have to worry about are insects. So there are two major insects that like to eat stored hides and those are moths. The same kind of moths that eat your wool are also so excited to eat your stored furs and skins. Um, and then hide beetles which are a very very small beetle. They're called a dermestid beetle um, and they're real problems places like museums that are storing skins or like you know displays at museums with with taxidermied animals. They have to treat those with things to keep hide beetles from attacking them. So that's the main issue that you're dealing with in your stored skins. So there are a bunch of different things you can do. Um, one thing to know is that what moths and hide beetles are drawn to is dark areas without a lot of movement and basically like little hidden corners. So sometimes you'll find that like you'll have a, a wool carpet and you'll move a piece of furniture and just where the legs of the furniture were touching have been eaten away by moths. They love little protected corners away from places. So if you have hides, they're actually better like out in your scene where you're moving them and interacting with them regularly to keep light and air access to all of the all of the sides of them. Like tacking them on the wall, that's a problem because the moths will get to the back of them 
and attack them that way. So the areas that the moths and the beetles are going for is the base of the hair right where it meets the grain of the hide. And both moth beetles, or moth larvae and hide beetle larvae, will chew the grain of the hide as well. But mostly the hide beetles are a little bit more after the skin and the moths are a little bit more after the hair. But both are gonna be right at kind of the junction between them. So sometimes you'll look at a hide and it looks fine and then you'll pet it a little bit and the hair will start coming off because it's been nipped off right at that layer. Usually you can tell if moths have been into something because there'll be little pupil cases and, uh, and they'll look like little small papery envelopes tucked into the hair. And hide beetles, you usually can tell that they've been in an area because they'll leave little powdery residue, which is actually their poop. Um, it's called frass. Uh, and uh, that's a good indication. So I have examples of hides that were stored well here and hides that weren't. So this is a mink that I found dead on a road on a road trip and I skinned and I kept in an airtight container. So it kept the both the moths and the hide beetles out of it. So it's looking pretty good. Uh, also here is a squirrel that didn't fare so well. I case skinned it and I left it inside out and I can see that on the inside See how when I rub it, all of this fur is coming off? So that's one that the beetles and the moths got to. And let's look up close. So you can see here these little holes. That's from hide beetles chewing right through the skin. And inside here, you can see bald patches where moths have just chewed away. Let's see if autofocus, there we go, okay. So bald patches where the moth larvae have chewed away and then holes here where the hide beetle larvae have chewed away at the hide. So unfortunately, I'm gonna be having some bald patches on the squirrel. So we've got examples of what to do and what not to do here. Um, so other things that you can do to deter moths and beetles are of course like cedar oil, storing things in a cedar chest, or you can replicate that by making little pillows of cedar shavings and keeping that in there. Those will tend to lose their scent pretty quickly and then lose their capacity to repel moths. Um, so you can also put cedar oil on little pillows like that and store that with your wool and furs and skins and such. Um, another thing is there are a lot of other herbs, so like wormwood is very good, or mugwort, or anything in the Artemisia genus, which tends to be a very strong scented and insect repellent plant. So that looks like wormwood and sagebrush and um, mugwort are all Artemisias. Tarragon, incidentally, is also an Artemisia. Delicious, not so good for deterring pests. Um, and let's see, so light and air. Um, you can also occasionally do a freeze-thaw cycle with your furs. So you can throw them into the freezer occasionally and that will kill off any larvae, but not any eggs. So usually you have to do a couple cycles of freeze and thaw to encourage the eggs that are in there to hatch and be larvae and then the freezing will kill them. Um, so if I have hides that I know have gotten affected by things, that's something that I'll sometimes do. Another thing is borax, uh, which is a mined mineral. It's not toxic to people, but it's no good for insects. So you can work borax into the fur and work it into the skin side, and that will deter uh, little pesky critters as well. So, but say you didn't store them well, and now you have this hide that's damaged, what do you do with it? So what I like to do is wash it in a strong soap solution and soap tends to, well, soap is gonna kill the larvae and the adults. Again, not the eggs necessarily, but if you do it a couple times, allowing the eggs to hatch in between, that should do well for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and dunk this squirrel into this soapy water. And often when you do so, that hair that has been nipped off is gonna come off and it'll kind of reveal the bald patches in your hides. So this skin is so thin that as I soak it, it's gonna, it's gonna be easier to turn right side out without cracking and tearing. So we'll be able to reveal all of the damage done after it's wet. And the mink I'm not gonna wet right now because that one doesn't seem to have significant insect damage. Let's see, yeah, that's already soft enough. So we'll turn that right side out and 
There are definitely a couple bald patches, but it's not actually too bad. I'm going to go ahead and use more soap on this one just to make sure it's enough to really kill any critters that might be in there. So, so dish soap works really good for this. I'm just using some Dr. Bronner's, which is a liquid Castile soap that I have on hand for hide tanning and felting generally, as well as washing myself. Um, so yeah, really getting a good lather because the soap is what kills insects by basically smothering them. It uh, breaks up the waxy layer that keeps their breathing holes open. Anyway, I studied entomology, so I could which is the study of insects. I could go on at length about insect physiology, but maybe that's not the thing for this particular video. So keeping that immersed in soapy water long enough to make sure that you've really drowned the insects is a good idea. So let's take a look at some of the other furs I discovered and the damage done. So I have a lovely beaver skin here that I was given, um, I think when I lived in Wisconsin, we had a neighbor who was a beaver trapper and got this in trade for a bunch of firewood that we cut for him. So there's a nice beaver pelt, which unfortunately has some good bald patches here and there. Um, and I'll bring it up there to show you, but you can see where some of the grain has been chewed into as well. So this is the grain layer and you can see some little transparent spots where that's been eaten into. So their preference is the hair right where it meets the hide, but they will, when that's gone, sometimes chew into the grain. Not always all the way through. The grain layer seems to be the most nutritive for them. So that is a lovely beaver felt looking slightly worse for the wear, but still usable. So I will be my plan is to be softening these furs as I'm teaching hide tanning next week. So just trying to kill off any insects now before traveling with them. And then I have this otter pelt. This is one that I found dead on a roadway. And this one is a little more worse for the wear. So otter pelt, uh, river otter, and uh, up here you can see this is all lots of bald patches. So a lot worse around the face and the neck and then down by the tail. So it's not unusual. It's very common for the damage to be worse around the face of the animal because there's all kinds of cartilage and sometimes some meat left on that area. It's really hard to get a really, really clean skinning of the face. And then the little, the little nooks behind the ears and such are just super appealing. Um, faces tend to have a lot more texture. So yeah, really common for there to be more insect damage in those areas. So good soapy water not hot but warm is a good way to kill off those insects and again um, also freeze thaw cycles will work and even after there's some insect damage you can work borax into the hides to kill those off and preserve them so so there's what to do and what not to do in terms of storing your furs and hides and some things you can do once you've discovered that you've had an insect infestation in your hides Good luck and please check out some of my other videos with all kinds of more great things to do with um, wild foods and hides and ancestral skills of all kinds. Thanks guys.